Gorengas puts together the class-based social criticism of Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, or Nathaniel Hawthorne, but with the mood and setting of Edgar Allan Poe. The whimsy and absurdism of Lewis Carroll, but the brooding psychology of Dostoevsky. The dreaminess of Samuel Coleridge, but the historic grandeur of Alexander Dumas. So I've spent a significant portion of my last month reading through Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast, or at least the original trilogy, which were published in 1946, 1950, and 1959. Now, I hadn't even heard of Gormenghast until just a few months ago. I mean, I'm a really big Tolkien fan. So the idea that there was another mid-20th century British author who is formative to the fantasy genre didn't really come across my mind. But after reading it, I think that peak in some ways rivals Tolkien. Now, I don't want to be heretical or anything like that. As a medievalist and a philologist, Tolkien will always be closer to my heart. But there's something about Mervyn Peake's Gormenghast that speaks to a fantasy genre that could have been. There's a world in which Mervyn Peake is the father of fantasy rather than Tolkien. And there's a part of me that wishes that that were true. I'll come back to this Tolkien comparison at the end, but I don't want to focus on it too much here because if these authors both weren't published as fantasy authors, there really wouldn't be much of a comparison here. Instead, what I want to focus on in this video is why you, whether you're a big fan of the modern fantasy genre or if you don't like modern fantasy and are more into literary fiction, why both of those hypothetical people should consider reading Gormenghast. And I'll do my best to avoid any specific spoilers for the series. Gormenghast is a gothic fantasy series which focuses on the goings-on of this very isolated castle called Gormenghast in this very indescript time and place. Gormenghast is this ancient castle ruled over by the Groans, and it's been ruled over by them for generations, for 70-odd generations. And so the castle is the seat of the House of Groan, and it is imbued with this hereditary power, this long line of tradition and ritual. And the first book opens with the announcement that the Countess of Groan is finally pregnant with a male heir. And in the first book, he is very quickly born, and his name is Titus Groan, which is the name of the first book. But this series is never focused on a single character. Very quickly in the first book, we're introduced to all of these wonderfully quirky characters that live in different parts of the castle. We get introduced to Sepulcrave, the Earl of Groan, to his daughter, Fuchsia, the princess, to Mr. Flay, who is the Earl of Groan's kind of advisor, to Swelter, the cook. And of course, we're introduced to this young, headstrong, rebellious, self-made kitchen boy named Steerpike. And this is really where this book shines, is in its characters. All of these characters are these larger-than-life, absurdist figures who all have their own quirks, motivations, biases. But what I like so much about all of these characters is that they all have one thing in common. They're all constrained and contained by Gormenghast itself, by the castle that in which they occupy. See, this is an ancient house, and if it's going to continue for centuries more, well, everyone needs to comply by the rules and hierarchies that have been passed down generation to generation. If just one person is out of place or one brick is removed from the castle walls, well, it might all come crumbling down. All of our characters in Gormenghast are constrained by formalities, by written and unwritten social rules and laws that they have to abide by. These social codes govern life in the castle, and where Peake's genius really comes in is how he explores how every single one of these characters, from the Earl of Groan himself to all of these servants of the castle, how all of these characters, in some way or another, big or small, rebel against these rules. And this means that we're forced to sympathize with all of these characters, and Peake casts a, a exceptionally sympathetic eye towards the women and the servants of the castle. But all of the characters in Gormenghast are victims in some way or another. 
everyone from the Earl of Groan himself to the lowest servant. And some of my favorite characters are, are, are the women or the servants who are otherwise overlooked by the social customs of the castle. Characters like Fuchsia, the princess, Irma Prunesqualer, the doctor's wife, and perhaps my favorite character in the first book, uh, Kata, who is brought in as a wet nurse to the young Titus Groan when he's born. She has a remarkably beautiful story that explores everything from imperialism, post-colonialism, gender, and sexuality. It's amazing. But so every resident of this castle is subservient in one way or another to Gormenghast. And of course, the main character of this series is Gormenghast itself, the castle itself. Like Jane Austen's Bath or uh, Daphne du Maurier's Manderley, the setting of this novel or the series is a character in and of itself. The setting is both the stage on which the characters act and the prison which contains them. And Gormagas is a wonderfully realized castle. I mean, it might be one of my new favorite settings of all time. And like the best settings, it is a living, breathing character. Well, perhaps not living, it's more undead in a lot of ways, as it's the literal embodiment of centuries of traditions, centuries of rituals and ceremonies and history. And it acts its ideological and hegemonic inheritance on all of the inhabitants. And this is really where Peake is drawing very interestingly from the Gothic literary tradition. Gothic literature is often very interested in a stylized vision of the past, one in which the past literally often haunts the present. I mean, this is why so many Gothic stories take place in castles, as castles literally bear witness to this historical legacy. Think of really anything by Edgar Allan Poe, Bram Stoker's Dracula, or Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. The settings of these novels are their themes embodied. And Gormenghast is drawing from this tradition quite explicitly as it takes place in the castle, and inside the castle there are all of these paintings and arms and armor and furniture that are often 70 odd generations old. And interestingly, the castle itself is quite ostracized from the world around them. We almost never hear from anything too far outside the castle walls. That is, Gormenghast is an island. It's a world unto itself, holding on with all its strength to its own history and not letting anything new in. But what's so interesting about how Gormenghast fits into the Gothic literary tradition is that he uses these themes of ancient traditions and ghastly inheritance to create a world that is entirely hegemonic in its ideologies. The characters, like any royal family, can't escape these traditions without upsetting the balance of the whole thing. But Mervyn Peake is really interested in exploring how all of these characters work to subvert or deconstruct these traditions, as it's the rituals, the ceremonies, the ancient structures that are really the primary antagonist to all of our characters' lives. At the core of this novel is a rebellion against lowercase c, conservative thinking, against tradition for tradition's sake, against hierarchies, constraining rules, and outdated social norms. And so Peake isn't just writing a gothic novel. He's using the gothic setting and the gothic mood to write a social novel, which explore the daily occurrences and the daily interactions between all of these characters, all of whom come from very different social classes and professions, and, but they all live side by side in this castle, and they all need to work together to maintain this castle. Gormenghast puts together the class-based social criticism of Charles Dickens, Jane Austen, or Nathaniel Hawthorne, but with the mood and setting of Edgar Allan Poe, the whimsy and absurdism of Lewis Carroll, but the brooding psychology of Dostoevsky, the dreaminess of Samuel Coleridge, but the historic grandeur of Alexander Dumas. And these authors I'm comparing Peak to are insanely varied, but that's exactly the point. What makes Gormenghast so unique is that Peak is drawing from all of these authors while imitating none of them. Gormenghast is sold as a fantasy book, but it's really in a category all its own. And so this is all well and good, but the best part of Gormenghast by far is the writing style, the narrative voice which is something that, let's face it, a lot of modern fantasy books um, utterly fail with. The prose here is brilliantly sumptuous and baroque 
and lush. It has the satire and wordplay and humor of Dickens, but the imagery is so reminiscent of an Edgar Allan Poe or someone like that. If you'll bear with me, this is a more or less random passage that, I mean, I could have picked from literally hundreds of passages that I have marked. But this comes from quite early on, and to set the scene, Steer Pike, this sort of rebellious, self-made young man who uh, is a, a kitchen servant, has just scaled the castle walls and entered into Fuchsia, Fuchsia's the princess, entered into her uh, room, and he walks in and he sees a half-eaten pear on the table. And let me just read this. He put out his hand and secured one of the wrinkled pears. Lifting it to his mouth, he noticed that a bite had already been taken from its side. Making use of the miniature and fluted precipice of hard, white, discolored flesh where Fuchsia's teeth had left their parallel grooves, he bit greedily, his top teeth severing the wrinkled skin of the pear, and the teeth of his lower jaw entering the pale cliff about halfway up its face. They met in the search and dark center of the fruit, in that abactinal region where, since the petals of the pear flower had been scattered in some far June breeze, a stealthy and profound maturing had progressed by day and night. I mean, in this seemingly unimportant moment, there is so much going on, that from the sexual undertone to the immense character work of both the Steerpike and Fuchsia, to the consumption foreshadowing. I mean, what else do you want in a prose style? And I promise you can flip to any page in, in the trilogy and find sentences that are just so lush. You can really sink your teeth into them. If you're looking for a book with non-stop action, look elsewhere. You can find any upmarket fantasy book on the shelf that will have plenty of that. But if you're looking for a book that creates a microcosmic world unto itself that is just so much fun to explore, a book that has a prose style that you can really sink your teeth into and get so much out of it, a book that has characters that are so interesting and unique that I promise you'll never find their counterparts anywhere. A book that is absurdly funny and deadly serious at the exact same time, well, you should probably carve out like a month of reading time and finally read Gormenghast. I find that a lot of modern fantasy books are too interested in spreading outwards, of exploring new regions, introducing new characters, new races, new people. Whereas here, Peak really shows the value of spreading inwards, of instead of zooming out, of zooming in. And what this does is create a setting that is teeming with microscopic life. Every single room in Gormenghast has a history, and every single object and person in that room has so much life. And of course, I mentioned Tolkien at the beginning, so I should say here that I don't think Tolkien nor his followers don't necessarily do this. But what separates Mervyn Peake from the Tolkien school of fantasy writing is Peake's focus on the minutia, on the details. It's in the details where Gormenghast really comes to life. It's not in the big battle set piece or something like that. It's in the social etiquette and the social conversations expressed between a servant and a, and a master at a banquet or something like that. And there's something about this that makes Gormenghask, for me, feel so alive. The focus on the minutia make this world feel so much bigger. And so I could go on and on here. There's so much to talk about with Gormenghask. Again, you could pick out almost any passage in the entire book and write an essay on it. Hell, there was an academic journal called Peak Studies that was just discontinued a few years ago, but it ran for quite a long time and there are so many brilliant essays in there. I'd really recommend checking it out. And if you're interested in actually reading Gormenghast, I would highly recommend this edition that was put out by the Overlook Press, I believe in 2011, and I think it was republished in 2020. Um, but this includes hundreds of Mervyn Peake's own illustrations. And these illustrations vary from just a doodle of a single character to a drawing of an entire scene, but they add so much life to this book. But let me know if you've read Gormenghask and what your experience with it was. I'm really interested to see how people in the 21st century are grappling with this novel, as I don't see that many people talking about it anymore, but I really think it deserves to be more widely read. But for now, thanks for watching.